I am your host, Crystal Salinas McKinnon. My family has been in Asheville for almost 20 years, and I'm currently completing my master's degree in peace and conflict studies at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. I became involved with WPBM as part of my master's thesis, which is in part based on exploring ways to build peace through media. Tonight, I'm delighted to be doing my first interview with um, and the first of WPVM's political candidate interviews of the upcoming election cycle with NC11 congressional candidate Bo Hess. Um, this is also the first political interview we've been able to conduct in studio since the pandemic, as we all have the pleasure of being fully vaccinated. And so that is very exciting. I've known Bo as a member of the community for many years, and as I'm sure many of you in Asheville have as well. And uh, so I'm very excited to hear about his platforms and his views on some key issues. And I'd also like to invite listeners to post questions for Bo in the live feed on Facebook. So welcome, Bo. It's great to have you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Before I begin asking you questions, would you like to speak on what inspired you to run for Congress? Yes. So I think the number one thing is um, not being heard, um, understanding that um, there were great ideas, um, letters being written, and that um, uh, no one was writing me back, uh, no one was paying attention, things in our community uh, were escalating. And um, I kept hearing from people, well, you need to have the political will. You need to um, donate to this politician's campaign. Um, and so I decided that I would be that political will and I would just go ahead and step up to the plate. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I'm a therapist by trade. Um, so my job every day is to listen to people and to make uh, concrete, practical solutions that make their lives better. I've never once asked any of my patients have an R or D or I beside their name. I work for them all and proud to work for them. And I think that we need some people in Congress that are everyday people who are not rich, who don't have a lot of money, but who understand how legislation affects the everyday person so that when we're voting on legislation or introducing legislation, um, we understand what the everyday person is going through. Okay, absolutely, that makes sense. <laughs> so any candidate that's taking on the incumbent Madison Cawthorn is facing an uphill battle. Um, I know that in the really great campaign launch video you did with Aisha Adams, which yes, people you. can view on your campaign's Facebook page, I believe. Yes. Um, that you're very focused. At, you're very focused on the idea of representing all of WNC and not just a particular constituency, which ties back into what you were saying about um, as you're serving your patients, you're not evaluating what. Uh, political party <laughs> they participate in. Mm -hmm. um, so what is your strategy for reaching the people of Western North Carolina, particularly those in more rural or historically Republican areas? Doing more listening, hopefully, than speaking. You know, I want to know what is on everyone's minds. Um, I want to know what is concerning you. I want to understand what we can do to make your life better. You know, I want to make sure that Western North Carolina is not left out of the next generation of jobs, that Western North Carolina is at the forefront. You know, Crystal, we have the most talented, hardest working uh, people here in Western North Carolina, and there's no reason why we can't have opportunity um, right here. So. Also, every part of Western North Carolina knows me from Avery County, Graham County, Madison County, Mitchell County, Buncombe County, and um, I've worked all over and with um, the families and the people of Western North Carolina. So I think also just um, capitalizing on that trust and rapport and, and then just building trust, building rapport, doing interviews like this where people can get to know 
uh, me and know my stances and understand that I am the one to take on Madison Cawthorn in 2022. So are you relying on increasing voter voter turnout or are are you more focused on trying to capture part of the Cawthorn vote both if so how increasing voter turnout no matter for what party is always important right that is a big piece that I believe in Um, uh, the primary strategy is a little bit different than the general election right now what we need people to do is um, sign up on, on our, our platforms, donate to our campaign, and we really need to build that capacity so that we go up against the kind of establishment politicians who, who they are going to run as a primary. Um, but, you know, ultimately, we need to get more people out to the polls, but also really um, bring in some of those moderates, bring in some of those disillusioned um, Republicans, um, um, sensible Republicans. And, and that's the thing. Republicans are not horrible or bad people. Republicans are great people. Independents are great people. Um, but that's not who the opposition is. You know, he's not a Republican. Um, and so I think that we will be able to, and I've actually heard from um, a few uh, uh, Republicans that said, hey, we like what you're doing. We like the message. We're watching you. That's great. Interesting to hear. So I guess let's kind of dig into the meat here of your campaign. Um, Again, from your... Yeah, I'm not going to cancel me. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Again, from your interview um, with Aisha, uh, I learned that there are three main pillars of your campaign, which are safety, wages, and healthcare. So... I thought let's start out with wage uh, or wages. I know also based on that interview that you have, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, a systems-based approach to problem solving. Um, Yes. In other words, you you seem big on not missing the forest for the trees. Yes. And I've noticed that theme throughout your interviews and all of the campaign materials that I have reviewed of yours. Can you, um, <clears throat> based on, on that, can you expound on your approach to wa- raising wages for the folks of WNC and Americans in general? Yes. So I think it's important kind of like to make practical solutions that we can implement in the moment while also having our bigger aspirations and goals in mind. Um, No doubt $15 is not even enough to sustain, especially in a place like Asheville. The issue is is that we have a lot of small businesses in Asheville that if we were to just make a blanket living wage or a minimum wage of $15, um, that may put some of those small businesses under. Um, I want to certainly help more small businesses thrive and establish themselves. So what I feel like um, we can do is make nuanced policy and um, create a structure within the tax system that provides the $15 minimum wage but doesn't throw that small business under until they get to an established um, you know, employee capacity point or, or profit margin. Again, that would be something that you know, our tax law, look at how difficult it is. This is not going to be a difficult proposal. We can get relief to the American worker, and um, especially the American worker who's working for places like Amazon or Walmart, who are making $10 an hour, who are purposely not being worked 40 hours so they don't get their health benefits, who are working you know, odd hours and odd shifts that constantly change so they can't be there with their family. Mm-hmm. Who are and, urinating in bottles. Right, and then, <laughs> and then the, the bosses are walking away with literally millions of dollars in bonuses. So um, there is a way to do it. Do we need economic justice? Absolutely. Um, You know, I'm a trained social worker, um, and one of the first things that we realize is that there is no other form of justice until there is economic justice. Right, and which I, as I said, I absolutely agree. Um, Do you, what do you think, though, what would you say to people who say, Okay, well, I'm uh, 
I'm a teacher and I only make, or actually, I'm not even going to speculate on that. I'm this one. I know for a fact, I'm a police officer who risks my life every day and I make $18 and 30 some cents an hour. I don't, uh, it makes me feel angry that um, someone at McDonald's would make almost as much as I make. So would, I mean, I understand, you know, in theory that a rising tide raises all ships, but, um, I mean, how do you see that actually playing out and, you know, how do we get over those like bumps in the road as we kind of try to raise the wages overall, um, industry and like, you know, up to a certain economic point status point so that you don't have, um, you know, people like, in other words, the difference between a surviving wage and, and a thriving wage and a wage that's appropriate for one's skill set. We tend to think of things in scarcity. And so if I, we, some other group is getting something that takes something away from me or, or some other group. And I think what's important here is exactly what you said. It will be a, a boom to the economy if people are making a living wage where they're not having to scrounge together their rent, um, their med money for their medications. And so ideally, you know, the police officer, the social worker, the doctor, the, the trash guy, uh, the nurse would all experience a raise in, in wages. The money is there. You know, that's not the issue. The issue is who the f money is funneling towards. I mean, we can even talk about credit scores um, when we talk about economic justice um, and the fact that black and brown people are still getting charged higher interest rates for the exact same credit profile, right, in, in mm -hmm. 2021. So really looking at the credit score and making sure that's equitable, making sure that rent making sure that utilities are counted on your credit score, making sure that if you don't pay your rent and utilities um, for just one month, that that doesn't hurt your credit score, right? So um, really looking at a, si a systems approach, not just from the, mi from the minimum wage, which is certainly something we need to look at, but looking at all systems, reevaluating the federal poverty guideline. Um, is huge. Um, having universal broadband access, right? Because once we have universal broadband access, the um, the craft men in Mitchell County, right, can now market his stuff all over the world. Mm -hmm. And so these are the types of things that right now we have a guy who's more worried about whether he can afford Jimmy Shoe shoes, right, versus bringing opportunity and jobs to Western North Carolina for everybody. Okay. And speaking of jobs, I just kind of, this came popped into my head. Um, you know, obviously there's uh, the Raytheon is building here. And um, I, I admittedly don't know all the details of what their job offerings are, what they're bringing to the community, but I know that there's a lot of outrage over it from certain people. Um, and then of course, you know, there are people who are like, Hey, professional jobs are professional jobs are professional jobs. Um, so what, what's your opinion on that development here? I mean, just as it ties into, you know, other bringing in other jobs from, you know, trying to get uh, big companies to do outposts here and stuff to increase our, our capacity for jobs that are outside of the service industry. Um, how do you feel about how we pick and choose those? I mean, are we, are we a moral authority on who these companies are and um, you know, where do we go from there? If we find that the, com some portion of the community disapproves, um, et cetera. You can't please everybody. Right. Um, I think bringing jobs to the area is essential, 100%. My issue with the Rayathon deal was the commissioner's um, essentially corporate subsidies and welfare and tax breaks. You know, if we are going to bring, you know, negotiating with them smartly, sure. But if we're going to bring jobs to the area, we need to, it needs to bring in also other benefits. There need to be um, other things that they're able to fund for the community. Um, and 
that's what I'll say about that. <laughs> what do you think about um, the labor shortage that we're experiencing here? And I mean, it's not specific to Western North Carolina, but it's affecting us, you know, at, at least as much as anybody else, particularly here in Buncombe County, where we rely heavily on tourism. Yeah. Um, what do you think is driving that? I mean, we know that there's a sort of trope that it's um, everybody's just on on unemployment, but clearly, while there's could potentially be a percentage of people that that's true for, we know that that it just can't be the the lot the whole explanation. So, do you see that as something that like Wall Street thinks it's a blip? Like it's an anomaly. They're not even building it into their analytical models at this point. Do you, so what do you think? I mean, how do you see that playing out? What do you think is driving it? I think we need people to get back to work, (laughs) but also going back to what you were saying, um, I think the old way of doing things is not going to work in a post COVID world. Um, and I'm not sure if the listeners know how much childcare is, but I've been getting a lot of people say childcare is an issue. Childcare is an issue. I, it cost me $1,500 for my two children, and I don't even make that much at my job. So I need to, I have to stay home. Mm-hmm. Um, I think like most issues, this is multifactorial. It's, you know, you can't just pick one thing and say, okay, this is it. I think that the enhanced unemployment Certainly, again, I think that does play a role in it, but humans are driven to work. Humans are driven to be productive. And so the idea that people are just kind of sitting back on their laurels, um, you know, accepting money from the government um, doesn't doesn't strike what I'm seeing on the on the ground. Um, you know, the biggest issues I'm hearing about going back to work are the um, child care issues and then um Also, just people are still scared. Mm -hmm. Um, We just got through a global pandemic where we have over 500,000 Americans who have passed away. And I think we're going through a collective trauma. And it, it, you know, it's not going to be as much as the economists want the economy to just kind of snap back on. It's going to be a gradual, um, you know, turning up uh, the brightness of the lights. We will get there. You know, the infrastructure plan that was just passed will get us there. It's going to create a lot of jobs, a lot of opportunity, even here in North Carolina. Um, but I think we are weary, and we've been through a lot, and I think people are just kind of being cautious. Yeah, I, I think it makes sense uh, to point out, as you did, that, you know, while the unemployment may play a factor, it's not the factor for all but perhaps a minority of people. Uh, Most people, they may be taking advantage of it, but it's because of some other underlying concern that they have, such as childcare, health, you know, fear, um, psychological trauma, etc. Well, that is a good place, I think, for us to go into what I think is probably the biggest piece of your campaign, which is healthcare. Mm. Um, so you yourself are a healthcare worker. Yes. And you also sit on the, is it the North Carolina board for harm reduction? Coalition. Mm-hmm. Coalition. Okay. Yes. For harm reduction. And, um, you know, I've seen elsewhere that while you, uh, s- somewhat famously do not support <laughs> Medicare for all, you do have some pretty radical ideas um, about health care reform. So would you like to speak on health care reform? And then maybe after that, we can kind of piggyback and talk about the harm reduction. Yeah. So um, I do believe in the greatest country and the most wealthiest country in the world, there should be no woman, man, or child that is without proper medication, health care, shelter, and food. I think that is a given, and I will work every day to make sure that that happens. I don't support a blanket, universal Medicare for all system at this point, and I certainly don't support it being called Medicare for all. And I think there's a couple things. First of all, Medicare is not free. 
Medicare you pay for, actually. And um, only Part A, I think, is free. And then B and D, you have to add on. And you choose based on different private companies. Medicaid, however, is um, free. Uh, government health care and on paper actually Medicaid is the uh, is the most comprehensive insurance policy you can have the issue with saying okay we're gonna pass a Medicare for all bill and everybody's gonna have health care is that that would be a catastrophic failure because we do not have the infrastructure to provide quality health care for those people who would get insurance so my proposal is again looking at the big picture and saying, okay, this is what my values, this is what I feel is important, and I think that there are certain ways that we can work stepwise to get there um, so that it's not a catastrophic failure and so that we can move towards a universal public option that can compete with the Blue Cross, Blue Shields, the Cygnas, the Aetnas, that has low administrative costs, low bu uh, bureaucratic burden, so that people are like, you know what, I like this America First insurance plan. Again, I don't want to call it Medicare for All, um, but I like this <laughs> America First insurance plan. I'm going to drop this Blue Cross Blue Shield plan because it's competing in the market now. Um, and people could keep their Blue Cross Blue Shield, but I think what would happen is you'd see a correction among the insurance companies because right now, because the Trump administration deregulated the uh, healthcare marketplace, you have a bunch of shell insurance uh, 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 programs, uh, policies that actually don't provide anything for you. Mm -hmm. And so, um, again, targeting those things are going to be important. So, let me interject yes. just really quick. So, what do you think about? um medicaid expansion as a starting point 100 percent. so because well, absolutely okay so no doubt forcing the states who have not yet expanded it to expand it because that seems like the simplest way to get 20 million people um on some kind of health care plan absolutely and the and do you agree that the infrastructure is already there for that um th we Almost. the infrastructure is there <laughs> um we would, I mean, think about if we expanded Medicare, how many jobs? I mean, just just on the job stand, stand front, right? Medicaid. Medicaid, yeah, expansion. I mean, just look at the jobs. Um, so I have patients who come into where I work, and they are desperate, literally wanting to take their lives because they want to make a change wanting to stop whatever they're doing and there is no place that will accept them because they are uninsured and if they had medicaid the whole world would open up and their world would be given back to them they would be productive members of society it is in my view a literal crime that we have people in our community that don't have access to mental health and health care with so much abundance here in western north carolina we have the infrastructure and Medicaid expansion is a great first step, but even still we need to build, you know, even starting from the high school and college level, making sure that we have enough nurses, medical students, making sure we have enough physical therapists, um, PAs, social workers, psychologists, making sure that we have enough people that are coming into the work field, universities, and then not giving, burdening them um, with hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollar loans that they can never get a hold of, but if they're if they're doing something for society, looking at um, a repayment plan where that is um, forgiven. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, I know you don't like the term Medicare for all, so let's just I don't know what. what well, let's just when we call it that, we just mean having a, a public option. OK. And I'd also like to point out to anyone who doesn't realize this, even in countries like the UK, um, northern Europe, the Nordic countries that are are all hailed for their public health care, that they still have private insurance companies there for people who choose that. And let me say this, too. The number one thing I hear from people is like, oh, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want them choosing what I do or like what health care I choose. So this is a this is a fact. 
the insurance companies are already choosing what you what you do, what doctors you you can go to, right? That's that's the whole point. And then the other thing is, oh well, if I wanted this surgery, it would be weeks to get. Okay, or months or years. Try right now. Try right now and just call any specialist. Everyone listening, call right now and call any surgeon and say, when's the soonest you can get me in? Guarantee you it's going to be six weeks or more. Okay? So we, the system we have right now, I give it to you, is not working. Okay? And we can build a better system that provides care, quality, timely care that's better than Canada. We don't even need it. We don't need Canada to be a, a, a... that is better than all of these places because we are the greatest. And I truly believe that. All right. And so do you, you also, um, <clears throat> you've talked about some interesting ideas about expanding really the even way we think about what healthcare is. Yes. And I really want to give you a chance to talk about that. Cause I think it's just, you've got some unique ideas. Yeah. So um, one of the things that we need to be looking at are the social determinants of health and looking at all the pieces that play into a person's health. Um, So, for example, right now, we can only bill for a service that I provide you. So you come into my office, I see you, I can bill you or your insurance company for that service. Instead of, and basically you have to be sick already to, to come into the place. Instead of a whole person or a full psychosocial approach where the person comes in with asthma, right? And instead of just treating the the escalating asthma, we go and we do a whole assessment for your home and we recognize, oh, wait, there is black mold growing in your in your basement and we need to change out your filtration system. This house is over 50 years old. That's something that we can bill. Medicare for all for, or we can bill Blue Cross Blue Shield for, so that we're actually moving down the stream and targeting those social determinants of health, right? Making sure that there is um, um, uh, um, prenatal care for pregnant mothers and making sure that while they're pregnant, they're getting um, all the nutrition, all the counseling, all the supports they need to have um, a safe pregnancy, making sure that um, um, doulas um, and things like that are are billable with their insurance in case some people don't want to go to um, the hospital. I know in Western North Carolina, um, out in the hills, you know, they'd rather not do it. They'd rather do it mm-hmm. at home and making sure that those mm-hmm. things are covered. Um, also, um, coordination among specialists. Um, there is a great um, study from an expert at UNC Chapel Hill that um, says that we wouldn't even need to expand the number of primary care physicians we have if we move to team-based care. So having a pharmacist, a nurse, a physician, a behavioral health specialist, a peer support specialist on a team to provide, again, wraparound psychosocial services. So we're not just looking at the person's um, sickness, but we're looking at, okay, what behaviors can we change? What thoughts can we change? Can we look at nutrition? Do mm-hmm. we need to look at a change of living situation? Do we need to get pest control into your home and, and start building up our society? And ultimately, to me, this is a national security issue. If we have a healthy, um, vibrant society, um, you can't mess with us, Right. Right. (laughs) Just uh, anecdotally, it reminds me a little bit of the TV show House when he would, as a diagnostician, he would send his uh, team out to investigate people's living situations, and that's how they would figure out what was wrong with them. Yeah, yeah. Um, So it's just like a really holistic approach that, you know, again, not missing the forest for the trees, um, you know, when we treat asthma, uh, if somebody's living in a situation that is not, you know, that's just going to continue contributing to their asthma, then we can give them all the inhalers on the planet and we'll never solve the problem and they will never be a thriving person. Exactly. So, um, I think it sounds like, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds like. Overall, you you do support the idea of a 
national plan that's available as an option for people for free yes or close to free um but that you don't feel that regarding infrastructure and and even just regarding um our population maybe that people aren't quite ready for that and so your strategy is basically like short-term harm reduction and long-term systemic overhaul is that accurate 100 percent you know moving towards those um those long goals um but really getting some fixes in now to provide relief right in other words we don't have to do nothing so in while we're striving for you know the the, perfect. the, the end goal the perfect um and i think sometimes this is where um ideology and reality fail to intersect for some people mm -hmm. um so this is i'm gonna sneak this in <laughs> um I recently, you, you said that you sit on a, we already touched on this a little bit, but what was the, what's the uh, harm reduction? Yeah, so North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition, um, well, there's one thing I know how to do, it's um, strategize and work with the opposing party. So um, North Carolina under North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition got the most progressive um, harm reduction laws passed anywhere in the country. So we got a syringe exchange law uh, passed um, um, protecting our law enforcement and our first responders from unnecessary disease. And we also got the Good Samaritan law passed, which makes um, small amounts of drugs or paraphernalia um, not prosecutable um, if you call 911 and help somebody who is overdosing. And we also got standing orders um, in for naloxone to be at every pharmacy so that um, it would be a standing order from um, the um, the uh, 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 Mandy Cohen, uh, Dr. Cohen. Um, and, um, and did people have to pay for that? They, at some pharmacies, they do. At other pharmacies, they will provide it. And what, do you happen to know what the, the cost of that is? It is minimal. I want to say, I don't want to misspeak, actually. But um, you can always get it for free through um, the, actually, the Buncombe County Health Department um, or your local health department. Um, I know that it's here at, at our health department. Okay. Well, I mean, speaking of the needle exchange, I'm sure as a member of this community here in Asheville, you're aware that um, it's not popular um, with everybody. And um, there are some people who have complaints about um, open drug use in their neighborhood. I think in particular, one of the needle exchanges here is actually located in a primarily residential neighborhood. Um, so I'm just, you know, how would you respond to people who feel that it's having a negative effect on their neighborhood, either through the littering of needles, open drug use, attracting more um, drug users to the area? I mean, these are just some of the standard complaints that we that we hear. Yeah, um, certainly it's a huge issue. Um, the addiction issue, the homelessness issue is such a huge issue. Um, and that is why I'm different than some of my opponents running in this race is, you know, I've been not maybe putting out nice statements um, when it, things are already popular, but I've actually been working on the ground with all these issues, trying to organize, uh, provide services, um, advocate for. Um, the syringe exchange thing is, you know, if people don't want them in their neighborhood, I would certainly um, encourage them to organize around that and see, you know, what they could do to, to, to move them um, along. It seems odd that a syringe exchange would be in a primarily residential neighborhood. You know, we, um, you know, what we did as far as North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition was make them legal because um, they were operating typically underground uh, before the law. And it, let me talk a little bit about why syringe exchange is so important. So syringe exchange actually lowers hep C, HIV, Syringe Exchange actually keeps um, people who are involved with the Syringe Exchange program, program are five times more likely to enter treatment and actually exit the cycle of addiction than people who are not involved in the Syringe Exchange program. Um, so this is where I um, understand where people's frustrations are. 
Um, and that's why um, if you are frustrated with the way that our community is going, then maybe we shouldn't give some of the opponents a promotion and we should look at other more innovative ideas so that we're um, speaking for all the community. Um, we need safe neighborhoods. We need um, even safe injection sites, right? So that people aren't in open public parks. Um, we need to give back humanity to people, right? That's how people change. People don't change by ignoring them on the street or by treating them like criminals or making them feel even more shameful. In fact, the data says that when you make people ashamed and feel shameful, they dig in to what they're doing and what they're feeling. So the, the trick is empathize and validate both. Absolutely, we, we, we need hep C, HIV, and we need our law enforcement officers protected from dirty needles on one hand, right? And we also need safe and clean neighborhoods for our children and our families on the other hand. And those are things that aren't, um, that aren't exclusive to each other, and we can both take care of both those groups of people and move forward in a way of dignity. Okay. Um, so on the subject of harm reduction, um, and I'm going to kind of sneak this in because I <laughs> recorded, it has not aired yet, but I recorded a roundtable discussion about um, this set of laws called FOSTA-SESTA that mm -hmm. are anti-sex trafficking laws. They yes. both passed overwhelmingly um, in Congress. And I so my roundtable was about... Um, unintended consequences that they've had. And we talked a little bit about this beforehand, so I think you kind of know where I'm going. Basically, um, through this roundtable discussion, which involved uh, sex work, uh, actual sex workers practicing um, anti-sex trafficking um, case manager, we had a, psycho a clinical psychologist, and... Um, we kind of came to the conclusion that it it's not um that it is unintentionally harming the consensual sex trade and when you take into consideration the fact that sex service the sex services industry in this country is a multi-billion dollar industry yet these um people are not protected by any kind of laws labor laws of any sort and then on top of that, they're being sort of indirectly targeted by anti-sex trafficking laws, which some people also say inhibit the ability to um, catch sex traffickers uh, because it pushes everything more into the shadows. That um, is accurate. So what, yeah, I wanted to know, you know, what is your opinion on that? If, if you were elected, would you uh, support a review or an overhauling of those two laws and would you consider legalization of sex work as a form of harm reduction? So I, um, I love this question. Thank you. <laughs> um, so let's, let's, let's take it back. I mean, one of I'm finishing a degree in public health right now, master's in public health from UNC Chapel Hill. And um, I don't know if you remember a during the Obama administration, there were um, some Secret Service agents that got in trouble because they had gone out for a night of fun and brought some ladies back and um, didn't pay them. And they went to the police. <laughs> <laughs> and because in the country that they were in, they have a system and they have a structure for recourse. So the police came knocking on the door <laughs> and it became a scandal here in the United States. I 100% believe that children, women, domestic um, laborers need to be protected from criminal gangs and sex traffickers. Um, one of the things that um, I also have done for um, many years is work as an advocate for um, a regional sexual assault agency here in Western North Carolina. So I have shown up at 3 a.m. with that lady uh, while she's getting the um, sexual assault nurse examiner um, exam done, walked her through that process, sat with 
um, males and females through through that trauma. So I've seen firsthand um, what um, you know this can bring. One thing that I want to get across to Western North Carolina is that I am wanting to be a representative that does not legislate your personal decisions and what you do consensually, whether that be smoke weed, whether that whatever exercise, be a vegan, eat nothing but red meat. Um, you know, I am going to be looking at making people's lives better not legislating things that I may have or that um, other people may have moral um, issue with or umbrage with. I do think that those laws did create unintended consequences. One of the things that I have consulted law enforcement with is sexual predators and actually catching sexual predators using techniques, using ways that will lower their inhibitions. When you get sexually aroused, actually part of your prefrontal cortex kind of goes offline. <laughs> and so that's why a lot of law enforcement officers will say, well, that just seems so obvious. They're going to know it's fake. And I say, no, it's not because their prefrontal cortex is halfway offline because they're so, they're so aroused, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that is something that I'm not going to say, oh, I'm, we're, you know, let's repeal that because I think um, – I would need to look at the data and just see what, you know, did it have its intended consequence, even if there was collateral damage in some way. Um, one thing that is important for sex workers, and this does, is that making sure that they have, um, you know, they're some of the most targeted people as far as violent crimes. And then also, um, it helps everybody um, be healthier if people have access to um, health care and um, testing and again, um, everyone out there who's thinking, oh, well, you know, I, I, I don't know about this sex work thing. Um, I guarantee 95% of us, right, have watched pornography. And that is part of that multi-billion dollar sex work industry. And even in that industry, there are horrific sex trafficking stories, stories of rapes caught on. So I don't think this is, um, for me anyway, this is not something where I can say, Oh, I, I support a repeal mm -hmm. because especially in the past four years, we've seen violence against women escalate. And I just don't want to do anything to put people, children especially, at risk. Um, would you? I'm excited to see how they twist all of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me just ask you one last question on that, though. Um, would you consider bringing... Um, actual consensual sex workers into a conversation yes. about it because that is one of the things that I've really noticed is that they are left out of that conversation. It's like the equivalent of when you see a bunch of old white men standing behind the president signing a bill about women's rights. Yes. I want to hear from them 100%. I, I want to hear from everybody. You know, and one of the things both in social work and public health is you can't make any intervention or law without talking to the people who it affects. Right. And um, so, yeah, I'm open to a conversation because I want to learn. I want to listen. Right. Um, I don't have all the answers. There's things that I don't even know I don't know, right, because I need people to, to, to let me know what's on their mind so that we can start developing a policy and strategy for advocacy around that issue. I'm willing to bring up all the issues that people have to, as your representative, but I just need to know what's on your mind. Right. So it sounds like to me, and this is bringing up one of my favorite words, that you're very against uh, paternalism. Oh, yes. Absolutely. So you're not coming in here hot with an ideology that you plan to impose on the people of Western North Carolina, whether they want it or not. <laughs> no, okay. quite the opposite. I want them to tell me what they need, right? right. And I want to um, work for them in Congress. Right. All right, great. Let's then move on to your last of the three pillars, which is safety, which I'm also lumping in security. Um, this, there's a lot there. Oh, yeah. But the, it first, just most obviously, I think, in as far as timeliness, brings to mind issues of um, policing in America. 
as you obviously know, there is a greater scrutiny than ever before on police. Yes. And it's created also a lot of division among the population as well um, because people have all different takes on um, on what's going on, and uh, it's just creating a lot of conflict. And I know that you've actually done some training with police. Yes. So I was curious if you could talk about that. And then after that, um, just tell us about how you envision the future of policing. Yeah. So like I mentioned before, I've done consults uh, um, as well. But here in Western North Carolina, primarily what I've done for a number of years now is train in crisis intervention, mental health, um, role plays, really training our law enforcement officers to respond, to notice when somebody is in a mental health crisis, to even identify what that may be, and then um, de-escalate them um, in a safe manner and get them to where they need to be, typically the hospital. Um, I love that work. And one of the things that that has shown me through listening, through dialogue, is that the police officers don't get paid enough and there is little to no combat training there's little to no de-escalation training um, there's little to no mental health training in fact um, you know I treat a lot of first responders in my private practice and one of the number one things every single one of them tells me is this cannot get out because this will hurt my career so that needs to stop, right? Because I think that if we're taking care of the community, taking care of our law enforcement, which are our community, we are going to build a better society. But I'm not going to vilify any agency or any police officer. What I'm going after is those federal laws that, that create these inequities that we have. You know, getting rid of the um, Controlled Substance Act, for example. Um, fully legalizing cannabis, for example, making sure that police officers have hand-to-hand -hand combat training um, and that we're not taking away lethal, um, non-lethal uh, means to them. What I've seen around the country is knee-jerk reactions and really stripping resources and, and things from law enforcement to use. The issue with, with that is that when you take away a non-lethal means of bringing someone into control, you get that much closer to a, to a fist, you get that much closer to a taser, or you get that much closer to a gun. And so that is the issue, is making sure that we are, again, you know, looking at those federal inequities that, that keep people interfacing with law enforcement while at the same time bolstering um, training and resources to law enforcement, and then embedding social work and mental health with law enforcement um, so that, again, we're creating a more equitable society. Law enforcement is focused on actually the, um, the, the guns, the violence, the, the sex traffickers, the things that law enforcement really needs to be focused on. Mm -hmm. Well, um, actually, I'm going to go, I'm going to skip ahead then for a second based on what you said to the issue of gun violence, um, but I think it ties in. Um, so in my field, um, which is peace and conflict studies, we consider all forms of oppression, generally speaking, uh, including denial of one's basic needs um, to be forms of violence. And so um, as peace and conflict practitioners, we would consider gun violence to be a symptom um, of another kind of civil unrest, typically poverty. And I feel like that's what you're somewhat triangulating around, which is that um, people are often, uh, you know, their root issues are not addressed. And that's why we see this ongoing cycle between, you know, police and violence and poverty and police and violence and poverty. And it just goes on and on in a circle that never ends. Yes. So in the most violent neighborhoods, if we control for employment, they have actually the same rates of violence that other neighborhoods do. So you're absolutely correct. Poverty and unemployment, lack of opportunity. And let's talk a little bit about the drug war and why that is for me front and center of this issue is because um, people don't um, know that um, having a certain amount of drugs um, is a felony. 
And when you have a felony on your record, you cannot get a job as a bagger at a grocery store. You can't get housing in a, an, in a nice neighborhood or in an apartment. So we need to end felony disenfranchisement. And maybe that comes after a year or two of, you know, positive, productive, pro-social behavior. But we cannot have people who are disenfranchised from the society and then expect them to contribute in a meaningful way. Yeah, absolutely. So then, okay, I'm going to go backwards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Speaking of... Um, uh, back to just general safety issues, and I think this is tied into national security, which um, you referred to in this conversation and also is referred to as a priority on your website. I'd like to ask you about immigration, refugees, and migrants. And I ask you this personally as um, the daughter of a woman who grew up on the Mexican border in a one-room house with eight children and one parent. And who, had they not been permitted to settle here, I would not exist, nor would we be having this conversation. So that being said, where do you stand on immigration and resettling refugees and migrants throughout the United States? Would you support accepting a portion of these displaced persons for resettlement in WNC? So uh, to answer your first question, I think that the, the immigration um, issue on the border needs to be an all-hands-on-deck issue. You know, every bilingual social worker, nurse, doctor um, uh, needs to be there and so that we are making sure and keeping track of the humans um, that are on the border. I do support a path to citizenship for the people who are in the country, who have been working, who have been productive, absolutely 100%. They need to be... Uh, not only paying into society, but um, because they're working, they need to be benefiting from society. Um, I do support, and we do have the infrastructure to uh, accept refugees. Our refugee acceptance, I think, uh, lowered by a huge amount. Um, one of my great friends who was in my MPH program with me at Chapel Hill actually works at one of these refugee camps, and I hear a lot of stories from him about the struggles that they deal with. So I absolutely would support bringing them in a measured way. Um, and again, wrapping them with services, making sure that they are, um, that we're keeping extremism out uh, and making sure that people are being productive in, in, in society, just like an American citizen. All right. And um, one of Oh, I know. Okay, I, I had another question about gun violence. Yeah. Um, so, going back to gun violence, um, how this is would fun. <laughs> just bouncing around? How would you address the issue of gun violence as we were just talking about a few minutes ago? Yeah. With, while also protecting Second Amendment rights, which I think is another um, focal point for you. I'm huge in um, the Constitution. Um, I'm huge. I'm not cancel culture, Bo. <laughs> you know, I feel like the more voices, actually, the better. We don't need to be pushing extreme voices into the dark corners of of the web or of the of the world. Um, I want to make sure that everybody has access, if they want to, um, to a legal firearm, and that they can protect themselves and their family. I think that's important. But I also think that there can be some common sense um, gun leg legislation and policy that we can in place that does not impose a burden on um, citizens exercising their Second Amendment right. For example, we need to digitize our gun records. The NRA has lobbied lawmakers for years and years and years, and we have no searchable gun records. We need to add more inspectors and add badges to these inspectors and get them out and inspecting um, these gun dealers. We understand that about 70% um, uh, of guns recovered come from 55% of gun shows. So we have a large, we have some or gun dealers. So we have some bad actors that are continuing to operate, and we need to get um, a hold on that. 
we need to look at um, red flag laws um, and making sure that, A, that there are harsh penalties for red flag laws if done arbitrarily, and then also that they are time limited and that a social worker or a psychologist or a physician, along with a law enforcement member on that team, can reevaluate them, let's say, every 30 days to figure out if they can be restored their Second Amendment rights. Um, I think we need to be uh, conducting inventories at gun dealers. Right now, the NRA, again, has lobbied lawmakers to make um, the policy and regulation we have toothless. So we already have the infrastructure for some great legislation that does not put undue burden on citizens exercising their Second Amendment right. Okay. And then now we've only got a couple minutes left, so I want to ask you really quickly, because yes. we haven't touched on any international type of issues. Um, you say you're pro-military, so again, quickly, what do you mean by that? And then regarding international issues, especially, I guess, as it pertains to the military, do you consider yourself an America first isolationist, a globalist, an interventionist? Um, in other words, do you think that we should try to regain our status as the, quote, moral authority of the world, or should we uh, keep our focus more internally? Um, my dad is retired Air Force. I grew up on Air Force bases, lived on, grew, um, moved every year and a half from base to base. Um, you know, I, I believe in not fighting wars for the rich. I believe in keeping our soldiers strategically in the places that they need to be. Um, I am not an interventionist. I'm not certainly a globalist, but I do think that strategic, geopolitically and strategically, we have to have our military in places to keep China and Russia, and to a certain extent, by extension, North Korea in, in line. Um, what I do believe, though, is that we need to be self-sufficient. I think if there's anything that this pandemic taught me was that if we have another pandemic, we're in big trouble. So we need to be building up a global infrastructure, like a global immune system, much like our body's immune system, that takes into account AI technology, that takes into account real-time medical and hospital records, um, that takes into account microbes in the air and on surfaces, and that can feed this so that we can pinpoint the next outbreak and just like um, our immune system um, go to it immediately. We need to be able to provide all of our food, so research and development and food and, and sustainable ways of agriculture, um, um, and even growing meat in labs and things like this. These are things that I really want to look at, especially when we start looking at environmental things and greenhouse gases. There's going to be a time when these big, huge factory farms are not going to be serving even the huge, big factory farmers. And so we need to be providing infrastructure of, okay, what are these next steps so that people aren't left out of the economy of the 21st century? Okay. Um, so, yeah, building, building our infrastructure here, here, making sure we have medical supplies. We don't need to be relying on China for anything that is of vital importance like bullets or um, anything medical supplies. We need to be doing, um, developing those with our allies in here in America. All right. And then I'm going to do a very, very fast rapid fire, and then we have about one minute left. Okay. And these are just quick yes or no questions. A couple of them you've already answered. Okay. So, death penalty. Yes no. or no? No. Trans women in sports. Ooh. So. Uh, too much for a rapid fire? <laughs> that's too much for a rapid okay. fire. And and because there's a lot in there, and as a social worker and as a therapist, you know that's a great topic that we can we can okay. expand on yeah. in another time. Okay, great. Um, the mentholated cigarette ban. No. Free community college. Yes. Student loan forgiveness. Yes. Legalization of marijuana. You already hit on. Yes, and then also making sure that businesses licenses are given in an equitable way to people who have been charged with cannabis. Uh, possession or selling and minorities and women all right and abortion remaining legal and accessible yes okay all right great well once again you've been listening to wpvm 103.7 on your dial and globally at wpvmfm.org thank you so much to nc11 congressional candidate bo hess for joining us this evening to share his platform with the community thank you crystal 
It was a great pleasure and so fun to finally be live in the studio. Uh, if you wish, you may find more information about Bo Hess on the Facebook page, Bo Hess for U.S. Congress, or Bo's website, bohessforuscongress.com. Don't forget that you can view this broadcast archived on WPVM's website, Facebook page, as well as the Bo Hess for U.S. Congress Facebook page. Thank you for joining us this evening, and don't forget to keep an eye out for future candidate interviews on WPVM.